Dr. Shehan Silva, MBBS from Javadhanapur, MD Colombo, MRCP London and in Edinburgh, Diploma uh, in UK Medical Practice, Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, I, uh, Diabetes and Endocrinology and Geriatrics, IFME Canterbury, and AFHEA UK. is a consultant physician and geriatrician in National Institute of Mental Health, Sri Lanka, and a senior lecturer in medicine in University of Sri Javadhanapur. He's the secretary of Sri Lanka Association of Geriatric Medicine and also a council member of the Ceylon College of Fisher. And very interestingly, he's a lay preacher and a church pipe organist in Anglican Church of Ceylon. So uh, Dr. Shehan is going to talk to you about rumblings of an avalanche, falls in elderly. Over to you, Dr. Shehan. I think you can hear us. Everybody, sorry to uh, join uh, from a distance. Uh, I hope you can hear me, right? Uh, so it's a privilege for me to uh, talk to you today, uh, this evening. Uh, and my talk is about an important topic, falls in older persons. We might think that this is a very simple thing, but it is indeed rumblings of an avalanche. So if you look at this picture, this is an avalanche. Avalanche, as you know, uh, you, you would see in, in pictures and you think always that it is a white color, nice uh, snow uh, dropping over the, uh, the uh, slope of a hill. But it is not so. It causes a lot of devastation. And indeed, this picture is uh, avalanche of uh, dirt and uh, debris uh, from a coal mine, which was uh, there in Wales in the uh, mid-1970s, the disaster, just like our Mithotamunda disaster. And it uh, caused a lot of deaths and a lot of destruction. So in the same way, falls we do uh, manifest uh, as an avalanche because the effects of a fall will uh, manifest later on in life. And one fall will always lead to another fall in the future. Before talking about falls, it's prudent, I think, to uh, delve in a little bit of about uh, the topic of uh, aging. So aging uh, or quality of uh, life is an important concept. And you see that there are, these are three uh, portraits of three different people uh, of various ages. So you see the queen at the age of 96, uh, she's still the oldest. Uh, leader of a state, the monarch, and you see a picture of Stephen Hawkins, who died uh, two or three years back. Well, I was uh, uh, privileged to be a part of the medical team uh, managing him then, when I was in Cambridge. So you see that he is quite frail compared to the queen, who is much older in the numeral numerical age. And, oh, and below, you see a child. You won't believe that this is the child, a 12-year-old child who has a genetic disorder called progeria, where there is premature aging. So you see that aging is not only uh, just a figure, but it is a manifestation of various psychological and physiological uh, factors. So frailty is a syndrome that is characterized by Reduce reserves. What do you mean by reserves? That's the ability for our body to fight a particular uh, illness or any kind of trauma. Your cardiovascular health, your neurological health, and your uh, respiratory and renal health. And the resistance for, for, to encounter any stressors, especially infections and trauma. And these, uh, the decrement of the reserves as well as the resistance results in added on or cumulative decline of various systems, physiological, uh, causing uh, vulnerability or increased risk of developing adverse accounts. So vulnerable and at risk elderly are frail. So 
if you look at this diagram as you see that in the x uh, axis uh, that age is uh, depicted and in the y axis there's performance or the ability for us to uh, lead, lead a life you see that we start off as a fit person maybe in our uh, adulthood or even before that and as the age goes on there is a gradual uh, decrement and it trans uh, transverses through pre frailty and frailty and then into permanent disability and you see where you get the red star so asterisk that's where the stressors come in illnesses come in and you see that this curve is uh, brought into uh, the reduced performance levels and even up to death so this is the manifestation of frailty so how do you know that a patient is frail so uh, the, these are the scientific characteristics that are used uh, well you can apply that in your clinical practice as a family physician you can then ask the patient whether there was a significant weight loss more than 10 pounds so unintentionally whether without any diet or restriction whether the patient had any weight loss if the patient feels exhausted or tired compared to what he was maybe a couple of weeks or even months back you can ask whether the patient has become slow in doing certain things maybe uh, doing uh, a simple show like you know uh, cleaning the house or uh, going to a place and whether there is any low activity level and whether there is weakness the weakness of course uh, if you have the facility you can measure it by using a hand dynamometer which is a more objective method so that is frailty so these five uh, characteristics are known as a uh, free will uh, uh, characteristic of course you can use this uh, diagram easily i think this is more applicable uh, more, more easily applicable to your patients who come and you see that from very fit to terminal ill and uh, you can uh, con uh, objectively quantify which is useful for your clinical notes and for your clinical practice coming back to our talk what are falls so this is a moment from the film of uh, three three years the hindi film three years where we talk about big big def definitions so the wh definition talks about a person coming to rest in inadvertently on the ground of low or other level you don't have to define that but what is important is that the term it was inadvertently so unintentionally that the patient comes to the flow and um, has many manifestations of falls so why are falls important because they are often neglected and they are major problems you might say ah vetuna that's it you know that and even as doctors medical doctors we just uh, take falls for granted and we just only manage the trauma and send the patient home but in fact it affects both quality of life and health economics there are a lot of people who come elderly who come to hospital with manifestations of falls and which cause a big load of uh, 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 of expense to the health budget and you see that as age goes on that the risk of falls increases so at 65 years or more one out of three people fall each year and uh, at, after the age of 80 uh, almost there is a fall every year so there's a term called recurrent falls so recurrent falls are uh, when when a person who has more than two falls within a period of 6 months falls are not just simply uh, slipping and falling but but they are a manifestation of Uh, many many uh, factors so this includes physical medical psychological pharmacological functional and uh, also external factors which we will talk about in detail so important thing what are the sequelae or the complications of fall so as you know that there are serious damages starting off with a bruise a contusion or a laceration which might need a little bit of suture there is a thing called frictional burns especially when if a patient you know have falls and rubs his uh, skin and soft tissues on a carpet or a rugged floor you can have frictional burns other than the laceration 
They can have bleeding, especially those who are taking antiplatelet and anticoagulants, head injury and fractures. So in terms of fractures, what is important is that these are low velocity fractures. Fractures which happen when a patient falls from a standing height or less. Or they are also called as fragility fractures where one would not expect somebody to have such a fracture in the normal course of life. They, are also, uh, they, they may also be manifestations of pathological diseases. So underlying osteoporosis, whether the patient has multiple myeloma or whether there's metastasis to bones. I, I suppose Dr. Barnagal would have dealt uh, more into this, uh, uh, but just want to take you through that uh, common things are that patients can have neck or femur fracture, hip fractures. Something that we tend to miss are pelvic fractures. Especially after falls, you know, elderly, they might have pain in the groin or pain in the waist. And you do an x-ray, you do not see any crack. They are so subtle. But, un but underlying, in the underlying bone, there may be a fracture going on, which is, which is not radiographically demonstrable. So if the patient has severe pain and if you feel that that patient would have had a had a lower uh, uh, threshold of developing a fracture, you need to uh, direct the patient for imaging, especially uh, a CT, uh, so CT imaging as well. And, uh, and other fractures are vertebral compression fractures. Also, another manifestation is called a fall on an outstretched hand. Suppose you can remember the anatomy days, you talk about these fractures especially the scaphoid fractures, the coleus fractures, ulna styloid, going on even up to the clavicular fractures because there is actual compression and uh, uh, disruption of bone. So coming back to sequelae, the fractures can also give rise to immobilization and, uh, and further uh, it can cause fear of falling. There's also a term called sarcopenia. What is sarcopenia? Sarcos in Latin means flesh. Penia means deficiency. So as, one, as a person who is immobilized by, or in bed, you see the research has shown that the muscle mass gradually uh, tends to uh, uh, reduce. There's wastage because there's uh, disuse atrophy along with other, con uh, other factors like nutrition and uh, uh, reduced stimulation of muscles. So you see that the patient goes into wastage and cachexia. Also, there, there is osteoporosis also that can be secondarily develop after immobilization. There's also an important concept called long life, which we tend not to uh, talk about. What is a long life? A long life is when a patient who falls on the ground and sp uh, spends a a long period, maybe uh, more than one hour or more. You see that very often in the West. In Sri Lanka, we are blessed that our elders, are, our seniors are uh, all most of the time accompanied by uh, carers or their loved ones. But uh, in the West, where especially when the people are living alone, they have a fall, especially in the summer when there's dehydration and warmth and Added to that, when there's blood pressure drugs uh, causing foster instability, and they lie on the floor. And maybe in about one or two days later, the milkman or the postman will say, ah, okay, that my milk or the letters have not been taken. This There's something fishy going on. And the 911 comes in and finds that the patient has been on the floor. So it's a marker of weakness, marker of illness, and also a social marker of isolation. So what are the implications? Delayed medical treatment because the patient has been on the floor for a couple of hours or even days. Patient is dehydrated because patient can't go to the kitchen or again get something to drink. There's muscle injury causing rhabdomyolysis, giving rise to myoglobinuria, acute renal failure, and uh, patient can uh, have electrolyte imbalance and even succumb. Because of long uh, life, 
there is compression of the skin and the soft tissues causing the pubitus ulcers, pressure ulcers, carpet burns, as I spoke of, the frictional burns. Patients can be exposed to uh, cold because they are wearing the same clothes and they are incontinent, they are drenched in their urine and they can, be, can become hypothermic. They can have developed orthostatic pneumonia. And further, this uh, vicious cycle gives rise to fear of falling. So these are some images of uh, decupitous ulcers. You see that these are these are the common areas, and you see that start off with just erythema of the skin, and then there's deep involvement of the epidermis, the dermis going into the fat, and uh, erosion of that into the bone, and there is necrosis, which is which can be infected and can have a lot of uh, implications. So, worsening medical problems again because patients can cannot get their diabetic medication, their blood pressure medication, their maybe their immunosuppressants, etc. Further to this, this risk of uh, this fear of falling, which we'll talk about later, can give rise to fear uh, institutionalization being confined to a home or being even confined to a bed and certainly increase the mortality and reduce expense, life expense. There's also a thing called post-fall syndrome where it's a psycho, uh, psychological plus uh, physical manifestation where there is increased dependence, uh, reduced com uh, confidence, confusion, immobilization and reduction of daily activities. So this, this is itself is an important thing which you need to uh, address in your patients, especially as primary care health workers. So we won't do, deal with this too much. To maintain our balance, you, we have, we, in our body we have a center of gravity and that is uh, uh, projected through the base support. You see that it has a narrow base patient has a, a person has a risk of falling quickly better but if there's a base of support uh, increased base of support that patient is more stable of course our balance is maintained by vision and proprioception uh, and the muscle the integrity of the muscles and the joints take a big role and also our uh, ability to uh, react ability to uh, make quick decisions to uh, external stimuli. These are all muddled up uh, as we age. So risk factors for falls. So these can be divided as extrinsic, where it is re related to the environment, intrinsic, which is related to the patient's medical and psychiatric conditions, and situational. Of course, situational falls uh, are very difficult to uh, deal with because they, they are one, one one of things, maybe breaking of an uh, uh, emotional, uh, emotionally sensitive news, maybe uh, some some trigger, but we'll talk about that. So intrinsic factors, what important thing is that falls with loss of consciousness, you need to consider whether the patient ha has a tendency for seizures, whether the patient has syncopal episodes, uh, won't talk too much about syncopal episodes because it's a talk of its own. If uh, you permit me one day, I would like to do that again. Um, uh, postural hypotension, arrhythmias, cardiac arrhythmias. Also vascular events, particularly to the posterior circulation, the uh, basilar artery and the vertebral artery in, uh, insufficiency giving rise to uh, reduced blood supply to the cerebellum, the brainstem giving rise to falls and also PIAs and stores, and also simple. What are the physical factors that are important? Age, uh, we don't have to talk too much. We know that through, as one age, there is increased risk of falls. Falls will beget falls. As if you have one fall, they will have a risk of developing a fall in the future. Impaired mobility, gait balance, which is spoke of, low uh, muscle strength, low BMI, Sarcopenia, as you said, as we said, uh, base stage of muscles and the postural sway. Functional status, very imp important. Activities of daily living at, and instrument of activities of daily living, which uh, we need to uh, 
time to time assessing our patients. Medical issues, diabetes mellitus, patients can have hypos, patients can have uh, polyneuropathy, diabetic polyneuropathy, patients can have autonomic neuropathy, where there's uh, in, uh, autonomic instability and the pressure can drop and tachycardia or bradycardia can come in. Patients may be having Parkinson disease, uh, where there's slowness and rigidity. And also Parkinson plus syndrome, uh, especially a condition like Scheidegger syndrome, where there is autonomic instability and the patient can, just like diabetes mellitus, patients can have falls. Medical issues like strokes, joint problems, like arthritis, cardiovascular disease, particularly aortic stenosis and um, carotid uh, uh, stenosis uh, and carotid instability. Patients may have incontinence and that may be the reason why the patient may be rushing to the toilet to uh, avoid an uh, accident uh, on themselves and that itself can put the patient at risk of a fall. Uh, also neurological conditions and problems with our sensation, hearing and vision. And I said, as I said, fear of falls again can predict future falls. Psychiatric diseases. Dementia, because there is loss of, loss of insight, the ability to make decisions, the diffi difficulty in, uh, in uh, assessing visuospatial domain. Patients do not have a sense of the 3D sense of uh, uh, environment. So that is another reason. Of course, there are other reasons like extra pyramidal side effects of antipsychotic medication, you know. Drugs like uh, olanzapine, risperidone, etc., can give rise to Parkinson-like uh, manifestations. And you know, you have seen that patients are given drugs like benzexol, RTN to uh, counteract that. So dementia patients can have Parkinson's features, and they may be overtly sedated by these drugs. Also, these things are manifest in other conditions like depression, delirium, etc. Very importantly, medication, right? Uh, antihypertensive medication, uh, uh, particularly uh, diuretics, which can leave, give rise to hypovolemia, and especially in warm, dehydratable conditions, patients' blood pressure can drop suddenly. So, you rather maintain a higher of blood pressure in an elderly patient who especially lives alone and who has a risk of falls rather than bringing it into a value like 120, 70, which is a textbook. So you need to lower your targets, just like lower your, lowering your targets in diabetes uh, for elderly, you may need to target your antihypertensive medication targets, even though the guidelines say something. Guidelines are guidelines. They are not gospel truths, right? Coming back, cognitive enhancers like polyesterase inhibitors, donepacil, right? We, we, we treat our patients who have a, the slightest indication of dementia, but we don't think that the patient may be having an underlying Parkinsonism going on, which can be increased by giving donepacil. So you need to go for a different cognitive enhancer like maybe Mementi. So important concept of polypharmacy, that is usage of more than four drugs, uh, is definitely uh, accompanied with falls. Extrinsic risk factors. So, uh, how the gra ground is, right? Are there loose carpets, loose uh, uh, papisi, as we say in single, uh, slippery floors, clutter all over, around, and there is uh, poor uh, maintenance, all those things are important. Especially these things, our furniture. If the patient is having an assistive device like a frame, that may also, although we think that uh, frames, walking sticks are, are going to improve the mobility, but mind you, they, are, they may be restricting uh, the patient's uh, space and the patient might forget the uh, device and start walking and then inadvertently have a fall. We come to a term, a, an interesting phenomenon, which is called Diogenes syndrome where there is extreme neglect, domestic scholar, social withdrawal, apathy, and catatonia. And there's compulsive sporting. 
right these are people who we say in sinhala botal patra ekatu karaganna type eke minissu so you see that these elderly people they clutter right i myself i have diogenes syndrome because i clutter myself with books so there may be people who have uh, who clutter things like you know shoes maybe clothes uh, plastic items so diogenes of course was a uh, greek philosopher who lived uh, in, in a meager way and believed in austerity and ascetism so this these are some of the things that we would see in their houses you see that there there's hardly any space for them to move about right and even in their workplace so lighting very important dim lights absence of light and glare those are important things slippery floors where there is water polished tiles uneven floors slopes uh, these days we make our houses at various levels so steps um poor lighting at uh, staircases bathrooms that have low toilet seats no grab rails wet floors etc inappropriate walking aids as i said although we think that the walking aids are doing a good thing but they may be doing very bad uh, they may have a bad influence especially you need to check if somebody comes to your clinic with a walking stick or a frame look at what is that circular thing that is there right that is called a ferrule so that is a rubber bung that is uh, there are at the end of a, a frame or a walking stick which like any rubber is liable for the uh, scuffing and wastage so please look into these things when they come to your dispensary or clinic whether they are wasted and these are easily replaceable okay. also unfamiliar environment that the patient may go into so you need to prevent falls so you need to address the risk factors make the patient awareness try to get the patient to be more active uh, the research has said that you know things like tai chi and yoga which is becoming popular uh, especially in colombo uh, are uh, a good uh, effective in reducing risk of uh, falls as a primary prevention secondary prevention when there is a disease we are trying to prevent a fall so you treat the disease carefully and correctly correctly and you address prudently you know just don't go by uh, guidelines but just you know use your head and the patient as a whole and uh, address it and eliminate risk factors tertiary pre prevention if the patient has frequent falls you need to prevent disability from that of course at extreme levels you might you in the west they use hip protectors and head guards like this but uh, uh, again research has shown that uh, the efficiency of these have been questioned so you need to target the group, your groups everybody who is more than 65 years of age you can bring down this age of 65 if you feel that the patient is frail especially even if somebody is 50 years or even 40 years and if you see that the patient is frail after looking at that diagram that i showed you the canadian diagram of frailty with nine figures apply that and always look into uh, these things which we will talk about uh, proactively ask them about uh, for uh, for the fall risk so you have to do it as an individual identification multifactorial risk assessment has to be done interventions and you have to educate so how do you deal with this if if you have if you have a patient coming to your dispensary you can quickly do a thing where you can ask the history of course you can ask the history but you can objectively look at this you can do two tests there's a thing called tug test time up and go test you tell you keep a distance of 10 feet from the patient's chair and you tell the, the patient immediately to, to stand uh, and walk turn around from 10 feet and come back and sit and you assess uh, how long the patient takes the patient takes more than 12 seconds or even 10 seconds that patient is having issues or increase risk of falls so this is a very easy test that you can do right i will uh, share all these slides so that you will be able to a ponder at this uh, slowly 
There's another test called the sitting and rising test, which uh, is a little bit, maybe a little bit difficult because our patients are not very, very used to sitting on the floor, right? So to squat, you tell the patient to stand and then you patient, they tell the patient to sit and then uh, tell the patient to uh, get up. And you start off with a 10 point scale and you reduce one by one. If you see that the patient is using the hand, the elbow, etc., and to uh, come to a standing position. Assessment. Always, if you have a patient coming false or no false, or, or, sorry, if patient is having flaws, use this mnemonic splat, right? Symptoms, previous history of uh, false, L for location, A for activity, T for time of fall, and uh, the, the other T for trauma. So symptoms, were there any warning symptoms of prodromes, lightheadedness, dizziness, vertigo, etc., or cardiac involvement, even palpitation and chest pain. Proactively ask whether they remember having a fall by tripping, whether they hit on the floor, whether they remembered what, what happened when they were falling and when they were on the floor. Amnesia. P, for previous history of falls, Ask about falls in the past year. If more than two falls have happened over the last six months, there's recurrent falls and increased risk. Be sensitive to their wording, how they how they use words, I must have, I think, mama hitano, mama vetuna, that sort of thing. Where are their falls were? Location. Activity, what they what were they doing? Were they trying to pick up uh, fruit from the tree? Were they trying to shave? Uh, uh, their uh, beard at that time and the stimulation of the carotid artery can uh, give rise to carotid syncope. Whether they were uh, exerting increase in thoracic and intra-abdominal pressure, etc. Time of falls. Was it after a meal when there is increased pooling of uh, uh, blood in the gut? Or was it the first thing in the morning? No. Uh, takes time for the blood circulation to leave, reach the head, right? So these things, and also about trauma. This is an important test, right? Brown bag test, right? Patients will always bring their sirisiri malla with all the medication. Please uh, take a time, take your time and look at what medication that the patient is taking. Sometimes the patient may be duplicating medication. Right? So this is an area that we as doctors really need to work on. I suppose you as primary care physicians and family doctors, family physicians, you may be doing that more. But we as, as uh, physicians or even uh, specialists, we do not uh, engage in this. But we need to be more uh, wary about the patient's medication. Ask about incontinence, footwear, environmental hazards. Look at the osteoporosis risk, which we will talk about. And always go, take the liberty to ask about the social circumstances at home, who's taking care of them, what kind of environment they have with their clutter, etc., And what kind of ability is there for in rehabilitation, physiotherapy, exercise programs, etc. Et Examine. If the patient has had an injury, look, look whether, look, proactively to see whether there's even a hairline fracture that is there and the other injuries that I spoke. Postural blood pressure uh, examination is essential. So this is something that we have failed in medical schools teach people over the years, how to check the orthostatic blood drop. So you tell the patient, very simple test like the tuck test, you tell the patient to lie down on the uh, bed for five minutes, check the blood pressure, heart rate, Wait, uh, uh, at, then you tell the patient stand up uh, and check again that in one minute and you do that at three minutes and a significant orthostatic blood pressure drop is when there is a drop of 20 millimeter mercury of systolic blood pressure or 10 millimeter millimeter of diastolic blood pressure or if there are any symptoms so these are very easy tests that we can do examine for valvular lesions do a full neurological assessment gait mobility, balance, uh, uh, neuropathy, sensation, 
disabilities look for especially for disability whether there are contractures shortening of limbs especially after um, uh, un uh, uh, treated uh, fractures of ne uh, fracture neck of femur etc amputations whether the patient uses a prosthesis and whether the prosthesis is correct and the use of mobility aids which we spoke of this again which you can do these days uh, using your uh, mobile apps or uh, even your computer where you can uh, do uh, calculate the uh, the fracture risk and osteoporosis uh, risk by doing a dexa scan and the fracture risk by putting these figures as requested in the frac score this these have been validated for sri lankan figures as well which are available i suppose you must you some of you must be doing this the adl and iadl uh, the bartel index so just a reminder about this i won't go too much about cognition you can do a mini mental state examination of course if you have the uh, chance you can do a thing called the addenbrooks cognitive examination 3 this is a time taking test of course and there is singhala it has a validated questionnaire in singhala also which is uh, which you can use easily but what you need to do is you can what you can do is you may not be do, able to do it in one visit you can give it as a print out to your the carer uh, if the carer is intelligent enough and you can tell the carer to tick off uh, the various things as what you would do in a mini mental state examination and this S3 or Edinburgh's cognitive examination is indeed a very sensitive method of detecting uh, dementia, especially early dementia. So, what are our responsibilities? We need to optimize the patients medically. We have to reduce the medication, review the medication, and try to reduce the number to a minimum. Try to deal with polypharmacy. Get a hold of a good physiotherapist. Uh, and if possible the occupational therapist and if the patient is able to or can afford or there is any uh, factors that are uh, conducive you can get the physiotherapist to uh, be a part of your team try to get as much as possible improve the diet mineral vitamin supplementation especially calcium and in uh, needed people rationally you can add on vitamin d levels especially for people who don't have nutritional uh, uh, optimal nutrition with vitamin d as well as less exposure to sunlight uh, proactively ask for home assessment of uh, hazards and correct them review the vision and you do a thing called a comprehensive geriatric assessment again you may not be able to do it in front of the patient but you can simply call up call up the other people especially a therapist or if you speak to a dietitian or a social care worker all these people you can you can have a phone conversation and make a formulated uh, program for the patient even in your practice and multifactorial interventions should be done so if there is a problem with strength or balance physiotherapist coming try to intervene and eliminate home hazards by speaking to the family the relations the carers etc psychotropic medication get the psychiatrist to uh, be involved physical medical uh, conditions always uh, get a senior opinion from a uh, medical specialist and include cardiac things as well if needed these are as uh, the condition develops so physiotherapist can give rise to uh, give uh, uh, thoughts about exercise and good balance training and the use of a good assistive device no point having an assistive device if the patient doesn't know how to use it properly we are we are not we are not very uh, competent to teach this thing so and we should not be uh, hesitant to get a physiotherapist to uh, teach a patient to uh, use a uh, assistive device so these are important things occupational therapy is a coming up field in sri lanka even if you don't have occupational therapy you can show some of these pictures and you can tell the family if they can afford uh, they of course this um, at slma you see that there is a stair chair right stair lift chair is a very expensive 
but uh, at least if you can try the other simple things like this hand grab rails uh, uh, raising the uh, uh, commode or putting a uh, uh, added on thing uh, for the commode so that the uh, commode uh, the seating uh, high, high height is raised in a patient and uh, addressing uh, other hazards like wet spaces and uh, tiles, etc. Oh, lastly, a little bit about uh, things. Uh, tell the patient as, the, as well as the carers about these red signs. If they develop difficulty in walking or maintaining balance, if there are recent falls, if there's fear of falling developing, if there's any psychological, psychiatric, manifestation, low mood, undue anxiety, difficulty in doing their routine things uh, compared to maybe a few months back, incontinence, etc. These are red signs where they need to uh, get uh, medical involved. Important of, importance of well controlling their medical problems and minimizing the drugs with consultation of a doctor, a good diet and good exercise and good rehabilitation. So uh, important that the environment is kept, kept safe, as we spoke of, good lighting, good uh, clean floors, and uh, other assistive devices. Always give support to the patient and the carers uh, with regards to relevant information. Explain clearly and carefully about the risk factors of falling. Take time and talk to the patient right, and help the patient to come to a middle ground where all these multifactorial interventions can be addressed in their context, very important. So key messages are that falls are common as age goes on. They have increased morbidity and mortality. They, cause, they are caused by multifactorial reasons and we as doctors we need to actively look at them. Important things are that the physio physical illnesses, polypharmacy and psychiatric illnesses are common intrinsic causes. And we need to probe in uh, to, uh, like house MD, right? We, go, uh, we need to uh, find out about environmental factors and hazards and a multifactorial approach is effective. So ending with a thought, I have put a thing called an uh, interrobang, a question mark and an exclamation. It's a question as well as a thought, whether it, is this unrealistic? The doctor of the future will not prescribe drugs. Instead, he will awaken the interest of the patient towards his body, as well as to re the reason, and the possibility of preventing disease, said by Edison, right? So very difficult to say that we will be a, we will not have a time where there won't be drugs, but we need to address uh, the patient as a whole and they are, uh, and to prevent uh, disease manifestation. Thank you. Sorry that uh, I went through fast. Uh, I, I hope uh, I have stimulated you uh, in this topic. Uh, these are all common sense and uh, things that we know of. Uh, it's just a matter of fact, bringing them from below the carpet uh, above and be uh, thinking about these things. Are there any questions? Thank you. Thank all my colleagues, the team, uh, Dr. Uh, Shobhavi, uh, Dr. Buddhika, and uh, also Irandi for organizing this session and helping us. On behalf of the uh, chairpersons, and the members of the elderly care and the CPD subcommittees of the College of General Practitioners of Sri Lanka, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to our resource persons, Dr. Upali Banagala, Senior Consultant Orthopedic Surgeon, and Dr. Shehan Silva, Consultant Physician, for their contribution despite their busy schedules. And also a special thank goes to our sponsors, Nortis Pharma, for the support they extended in these difficult times. And thank you all who participated uh, in this important session after a long time. And uh, have a good night and a very good uh, and wonderful week 
uh, coming up. 